Hello fellow homebrewers, JP here, and I want to introduce to you the brand new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Series available at More Beer. More Beer sells the highest standard in homebrewing equipment, and the Brewbuilt Conicals are just that. They're made from mere polished 304 stainless steel, and they come with loads of features that you and I have been looking for. They have a full 2-inch bottom dump valve, which will eliminate your clogging issues, while the sturdy base includes four reinforced legs, just like those big pro tanks do. More Beer also carries the Brewbuilt line of options and add ons like casters, pressure kits, and even external glycol chillers. So you can find out more about the new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Uni Tanks by going over to morebeer.com for detailed videos on the entire line of Brewbuilt Conicals. You can trust Brewbuilt with your next fermentation, and you can trust More Beer to find the right conical for you. Brewbuilt at morebeer.com. Folks, welcome to the session. Thanks for joining us here on our wonderful, um, enjoyable podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Justin Crosley, back in the studio again this week uh, with another live guest. We've been able to do it all year so far. I haven't had to have a remote guest since we got out of Zoom land in uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, And today, uh, my guest is Seven Stills Brewery and Distillery. Brewing and Distillery? Damn it. Brewing and Distilling, or Brewing Brewing and Distilling, distilling. Brewery and Distillery, whatever you want to call it. But it is Brewing and Distilling. Brewery and Distillery. Oh, so I was close. Yeah. Okay, good. I practiced. You almost had it. I practiced. (laughs) You need your cards. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, and I forgot to ask you just for even though I've had you on the show before too. Yeah, uh, is is Aubert the French Aubert or is it Obert? It's actually Obert. It is Obert. Yeah. Okay, you're so not French. Not, I'm not French. No. Okay, yeah, should have checked that before the show too. <laughs> no, I'm Whatever. Not. I'm still rusty after all these, <laughs> after all these beers. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of cobwebs yeah. to clear away, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good. I'm gonna write. That's a good parody it's song. Not still bad, rusty yeah. after all. That's the, a weird Al song <laughs> for you right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he must have done that already. It must be right. It must be done. Yeah. So Seven Stills out of San Francisco yep. and in my studio here in sunny Concord today. Uh, and then Teresa Pasuti is in the studio co-hosting with me. Yeah. Thanks, Teresa. Oh, my pleasure, always. You both got stuck in all of the um, uh, San Francisco Bay Area traffic today getting here. I appreciate you taking the trek. No, it's it just gives me time to listen to my songs, you know, and blast yeah. the radio. There have a little alone time. It's good. Nice. Well, and for you... Um, you're used to the the extreme heat in on this side of the bridge, but 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 poor Tim here had to come. You know, it's probably a thirty degree change from San Francisco. Well, I'm staying in Nevada right now, so it's baking hot up there. Oh, so you, <laughs> it you is do it every day. Yeah, right. It's bad. So I would stay at work longer if I'm you. <laughs> yeah, you definitely. Know? Yeah, the the San Francisco Bay microclimates. Never, never get old talking about that if you're a Bay Area resident. Well, and and we are so well adjusted to heat right now. We just start sweating. Like Mm. the moment you get too hot, you're just totally drenched in sweat all the time. Yeah, it's It's, super fun. Yeah, it's like humidity. It's just like coming out of your body. It's so weird. What is it like? 105 in Nevada? Yeah, around this week. No, I mean it hasn't been quite that high. It's been like high 80s, like okay, low 90s. But we went to the pool yesterday and it was great. Yeah, that's that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah, and, and up in Auburn, just to give our listeners oh, an idea well, of what kind of heat we're talking about I here. I mean, so we had probably 100 today, but we've, honestly, it's been a mild summer because it's only been like 105. Okay, yeah. And it was 100 for like a week, yeah. but usually it's like for a month. Right. So like, honestly, it, you can't really complain that much. No, that's not bad. Although, so I, you know, I've always said my listeners know, and I've like I'm from the desert. I grew up in the desert. So I've been a lizard, you know, my whole life. But I've been in the Bay Area now for a long time, since since 95. And this is the first summer where I can feel a change in my in my body. Because here it's been mm-hmm. like 90, hasn't even really broken 100. Mm-hmm. And I, 105, 110, I was fine. I'm fine. And I've been that way for years, even here. Really? And this summer, which is like a kind of milder, it's only in the high 90s. 
I've been dying. And wow. I just, I sat down and thought about it the other day and I was like, shit, I'm evolving to the Bay Area climate after all these years. <laughs> I don't consider that a good thing. Well, I evolved to California climate like almost immediately. I moved from Colorado. Oh yeah. And went to Southern California, and then when I went back to Colorado, I was like, "Oh my god, it's yeah. cold." Yeah. Like yeah. the cold, I I I can't support the cold. I could deal with heat, never but could. not the cold. Right, so now I'm stuck because I could never deal with the cold and I still can't. And now I'm not even dealing with the heat. I'm going to have to uh, move to San Francisco. You can soft. I left. Or Oakland. I don't live in San Francisco anymore. Yeah, cuz now you're in Nevada, you said. Not even there. Nope. Where's Where's your home now? I live in San Diego. Oh, you're a, see, you're brilliant. That's what you do. <laughs> when you When your body evolves, you go to San Diego. That's where I grew up. So yeah, I moved okay. back there. Nice. Oh wow. Yeah, that's a good move. Yep. <laughs> it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. All right, I got a couple things to to get through on the business side. I want to thank our sponsor, uh, More Beer. Of course, have been our sponsor since the beginning, and boy, do I love those folks. Go to morebeer.com and check it out. Uh, you've heard me talking about their Comos line of everything. I just love it. Uh, get yourself a kegerator. Um, I've got their plate chiller jockey box, which I'm going to be using this weekend. Um, I'm, and I'm very excited about it, except I'm going to interrupt the business for a moment. It's going to sound random, and it is. Co-ed baby showers. It's not, I'm not into it. <laughs> and I don't, and I would never do it to my friends. Um, no? And I guess this is, maybe, maybe this is sexist. I don't know. but I, Or maybe I'm just really not into babies, right? I don't have kids. Oh, it's yeah. not like really in the plan. And you know, somewhere along my lifetime, uh, and your lifetime, as uh, co-ed baby showers became the thing, and and now I can't say no to them. I can't just say, "Oh, I don't like your baby." I have to, so I have to go to a co-ed baby shower. Uh, but I'm bringing my Como jockey box. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, just that's, make it about the drinking. That's and what less I'm about do. the hundred percent. That is <laughs> yeah, going to make yeah. it better. Yeah. Like honestly, I think there there can be two cohorts at this co-ed baby shower, and it doesn't have to be just the men and the women. Because yeah. even though I have kids, I don't particularly enjoy babies either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, just, I don't know. They're so, so useless. You can like have the people out by the beer and right. the people who really want to like open the presents and do the games and like. And I'm hoping that, that's you what can't happens. force that stuff on people. <clears throat> and I, I do love kids. Like I've got a, a, a my my nephew's not a kid anymore, but I have like good friends where their little kids are my nieces and nephews too. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like those babies when they were babies either. I don't like them <laughs> until they, once they can talk to me and like yeah. even like at three or whatever. Like I don't know what age. What age do people start talking? Oh, you know, sometimes one? it's earlier. Is it really? Yeah, it can be. Oh, it can be yeah. as early change, as let one. Me, let me let me change it. Converse. What what age do they converse? So I have a oh. two year old now. And yeah, she is chatty. Okay, she's super chatty. Yeah. So yeah, that's when I'm she, all is in. She a then good I love listener. it. She like does she listen to your she feelings? She does. Yeah, and she repeats stuff, and she says she repeats stuff so much. She always says, "Did you hear my message?" Hear my message? <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, it's so cute. See, that's what I'm all in. As soon as there's like some back and forth communication before that, it's, before a, that it's a lump and everyone's like no you gotta come hang out with the baby hold the baby and I just and I'm sorry I'm just not that person it's wait it's a kid, baby yeah. right, it's a right. baby shower but the baby's already born no 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 no, no. I'm just I'm saying confused. in general I'm now oh, going okay. back in and general, just saying just like okay. babies, in, I'm bouncing around a little okay, bit okay got just, it got yeah, it I'm just saying babies they're just so like I don't know can't babies baby should just grow up with their parents alone until they can converse that's what I'm saying I'm kind of kidding that I don't like babies at all but like yeah, yeah. the the three-year-old explanation like i will i'm there for that all day long yeah i'm just like tell me just tell me about all your things yeah yeah no same that's where I, then i'm fully engaged and then i'm like I, like i really do like watching little humans uh <laughs> Until they get a little older. Sponge. Like that I it fascinates yeah. me how fast they it's learn insane. things. It's exponential. And that's what so that I really love. I'm like, just skip over to that part and it looks super fun. You but know. that's why it's so cool when they're young and you're I'm a first time dad, so like okay. I'm just obsessed with it because I'm like, this is exponential learning at this point, so I want to so teach cool. you as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get I just way overdo it and I buy like the like <laughs> neuroscience <laughs> books and biology okay, right. and like yeah physics for babies and she doesn't care at all right but She's like that's a red ball and I'm like yeah <laughs> it is a red ball cool but see even that I'm <laughs> like yes you see how they know it's a red ball it's just what fascinating I'm trying to teach her about like energy exchanges and stuff and <laughs> You see the ball is red, and I'm like, God, all right, well, we're missing the point here. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> but on occasion, she's going to, like, 
spit something back to you, and it, you're gonna, it's going to blow your mind. You're she like, does it every day. Ah, see, I love that. That well, part's she's cool. in school, so she'll learn stuff every day, and she comes back, and she just starts saying stuff, and it's super weird. Uh, see, that part's cool. Yeah. So I do not. So I get. Kind, I think I get the best of both worlds because I'm just fun uncle. I just exactly, yeah. show up, do all that hanging out, and then. He's in the keg yeah. and leave. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm bringing my uh, more beer Comos uh, kegerator, and um, I'm also bringing, shout out, uh, why not? Because I love them and, and they're friends too. I'm bringing Faction Penske File Pale Ale. Good beer. As a Solid keg. Solid choice. Yeah, yeah. They asked for a pale ale, and that's kind of kind of always my go-to right now, the, the Penske. So I'm doing that. Um, so thank you so much uh, to More Beer and to all of our sponsors for bringing you this session. If you want to support the show, too, you can visit our sponsors like More Beer. There's a sponsor page on the website, thebrewingnetwork.com. You can click on any of those sponsors and check them out, too. Um, you can also you can donate uh, via PayPal. Uh, you can subscribe uh, you know, for as little as like 2 bucks a month uh, or just do like a one-time thing. Um, it's a very low-budget show, and it's uh, our listeners and our few sponsors that keep it alive. So so uh, we thank you for, for doing that. Uh, you can also, if you don't want to spend an extra dollar at all, you could do your Amazon shopping, which you're going to do anyway. Don't lie to me. You all shop on Amazon. Uh, just click the Amazon banner right there on our homepage and then shop away. Just do your thing. Um, all right. If you got any feedback for the show uh, or our guests, I, I forward it along to them. You can send it to feedback at thebrewingnetwork.com. So you just get a kickback from Amazon. <clears throat> I'm not supposed to say that, but basically, yeah. Oh. I don't know. There's like weird things in their bylaws, but uh, yeah, it's just like a, it, but it's like any affiliate program. I don't know why we can't say it. Every, all the other YouTubers say it. They must, yeah. Um, but yeah, like if you put, you know, links in your description of the show, which uh-huh. I don't do enough, um, and then it's got like some attachment, like on the end of the hyper. Yeah, and then you just get like a little percentage. And so there's been months like Christmas is cool for us, like because some of our listeners who are really supportive, they'll like think about it. if they're gonna go make like some big purchases totally, yeah. they'll just be like oh I'll remember to click the Brewing Network link and it doesn't cost them anything right not a thing they pay the same price it's amazing yeah and it's it's you know it's always been a really cool thing for us and I always just mention it because like yeah not every listener wants to or can afford like an extra little Brewing Network donation and yeah whatever that's fine that's why the show's free but there are simple ways that cost you nothing so yeah it's passive income it's great yeah yeah my hope is that it grows that I could just retire like next week uh, but I don't yeah. think that's going to happen. I now, met another early retiree. I'm fascinated also by early retirees. It's the thing now. Right? It's what everybody in the Bay Area does. Yeah. Re- <laughs> Which is, yeah. The whole economy is going to come to a halt soon. Not because of what we think. It's going to be because everybody just decided not to working. work. They're done working. Yeah, like, yeah I made $400,000 a year for the last five years. So I'm done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good and then I sold my $3 million house. Right. And now I live in a tiny home. And now I live in a van. Yeah. Yeah. Like, literally, whatever. that's... It's, I mean, I'm it's, already halfway I there. I live them. in a van. I live in an RV. It's a big <laughs> van. Um, uh, so I'm already, I've already, di- I've downsized. I'm doing, I'm on my way. It's the income part is the, is the second <laughs> part of the equation. The, the but pa- You just need that passive income yeah, it'll connection. Get there. It'll, it'll get there eventually. Um, okay. So before we get to the story of uh, Seven Stills, yes, let's talk about the Kolsch from you that's in our glass. A delicious uh, German-style Kolsch. Um, I'm going to assume, before you tell me about the beer, that this is a beer you also use as a wash uh, to make uh, your spirits? It or is not. It's not. Is it too low of an alcohol to start? Yeah. Usually when we're making our whiskeys, we want to use something that's higher alcohol because obviously the higher alcohol, the more alcohol you're going to get out of the beer. Okay. So this is just a beer that we make because we like it. Got it. Yeah. It's a great style. Yeah. It's super good. And this is a nice beer. Yeah. So it uses some of uh, Admiral Malting's malt um, oh, yeah. from the East Bay, from Alameda. So yeah, it's got some uh, some of their oats and then the... It's basically super clean, just Pilsner malt. Mm-hmm. It's got that little, like that slight kind of fruity, mm-hmm. um, little perfume in the in the in the flavor. I think. Yeah, it's like the Kolsch yeast. Do yeah. You, do you know what yeast? You yeah, use? I'm gonna pull up my uh, cheat sheet here. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm pulling a Drake. I told you. I I'm told you. I warned you. I was gonna <laughs> grill you, pull you up over your this. Phone to <laughs> lyrics. Yeah. You're freaking freestyling on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I don't. Well, Drake was on some like 
some podcast thing and he's like freestyling, but they're filming it and he's got his phone in front of him. He's <laughs> yeah. reading off the lyrics. There's nothing free about it. Maybe style, but nothing free. There's, yeah, it's there. So this is their Roar. Uh, it's Roar Pil- uh, Pilsner Malt, Premium Pilsner. <clears throat> oh, okay, got and it. And then it's basically just the Admiral Yolo Gold Malted Wheat and then the um, Yolo or the Admiral Pacific Vilt- uh, Victor. Okay. Oh, got uh, it. Okay. You're asking about the yeast. Yeah, if it's a, the, just a standard Kolsch yeast. Or? Yeah, it's just a Kolsch yeast, but yeah. I don't have what actual strain it is. But yes, it is. And Herzbrecher is the hops. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. Super light, super creamy. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be crushable, which I think it is. Oh, mm-hmm. it is. For sure. <clears throat> yeah. It's a little maltier than mine. And mm-hmm. that could, that's probably that Pacific Victor. Yeah. But, so we, for ours, like our Kolsch is super near and dear to us. Um, we use uh, German <coughs> Weimann pills and just a little wheat. Oh, nice. So it's a little less malty, but it's not a flaw. It's a feature. Like, it's always like, you know, when you make your own beer, you always compare that yeah, beer totally. style to the one you do. And you're like, oh, And it seems like it's something that's easy to compare because it's, it's such a neutral base. So yes. anything really stands out in it. Yeah. But this actually, uh, this stemmed from a collaboration that we did with Admiral Maltings like eight months ago. I guess it was called Maltster and Commander. Okay. And Dave nice. McLean from Admiral Maltings basically wrote the recipe for this beer. Okay. Oh, cool. And we kind of adapted that because it was such a good beer into something that we ended up turning into one of our core styles. Heck yeah. So it was just so good. And it was like everybody who tried it was like, this is the best Kolsch I've ever had. And we're yeah. like, all right, yeah. we're making this year round now. So. Well, and so to me, Dave McLean is like one of the kings of classic styles. Like yeah. he just always was, mm-hmm. right? Like it, it, you wanted a good mild, you went to Dave, right? You went to Magnolia. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a good, it's got a good pedigree, this Kolsch. He does, yeah. Yeah, nice. All right, beautiful beer. Okay, so let's do, now we've, if you can go, listeners, if you want to go back, we've had um, uh, Tim on before. In fact, you've been on this show, but you also were on our uh, distilling show, uh, Heads and Tails, with, uh, that you were on with JP and Beardy, unless it was maybe your distiller that was on with them. That might have been, yeah, that might have been my partner. Gotcha. Um, So you can go back if you want to listen to uh, the the original story, but so much has changed since then. I just want to give you like a, a quick uh, uh, version of the original history, but you started as a home brewer. I uh, did, yeah. yeah, just a uh, brewing beer. But you, it sounds to me like you got excited about distilling. I did, and it was because I was looking for a way to get into the craft <clears throat> beer industry. Okay, but I didn't like how busy it was and how saturated it seemed like it had become already. I see. So basically, I was trying to find a way to get into the craft beer industry without getting into the craft beer industry. Yeah. So I was already getting really into like this home brewing, like you're saying, and like I had a little 15 gallon set up in my at my house, and I'm making beers for myself, and I'm drinking them with buddies or whatever. Yeah. Um, what but, was your career then? What were you doing with for your life? Um, I had just graduated from college, so okay. I was running my mom's transcription company. So I had like a little bit of backgrounds in project management and managing employees. Um, but this was kind of just a hobby, and I was still just yeah. You know, I was twenty one, twenty two, so I was still a little shithead, and I was just <laughs> drinking a lot of beer at the time, getting into the culture and the quote unquote culture. Right, right, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I was in, in San Diego at that point, so I was just obsessed with Stone, obsessed with this whole idea. I think of making a product that was your own that you could share with somebody that they really liked. Okay. And alcohol just kind of has this thing to it where everybody really likes it and they (laughs) get excited about it. Yeah, that's true. So there was something about being able to share this product with other people that was really just like captivating to me. Yeah. So I knew I wanted to get into the space. I, I really liked how fun it was and how, you know, everybody who was doing these craft beers had really loud and really like outrageous packaging and it was all cartoony and they had these new styles of beer coming out once a week or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I didn't like how busy the space was. Okay. So basically what I did um, was I entered it into I entered into the category by going backwards and I decided to start the company by distilling different styles of craft beer into whiskeys. Okay. <laughs> And the idea was that we were going to try and, like, capture the audience that was already super, like, captivated by the craft beer scene, but introduce them into a new product that was craft whiskeys inspired by craft beers. Okay. Yeah. So were those early craft beers also sold to, to drink on their own, or was it just they like... They not. Yeah, yeah. So you were just... But making whiskey from true craft beer. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was experimenting a lot. So the first style that we did was it wasn't more it wasn't one of the more like popular like hazy IPAs or a sour or whatever, but it was more traditional. So it was a chocolate oatmeal stout with peat smoked malted barley. Okay. And yeah. that was called Choka Smoke. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 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 
Um, yeah, so that was the first whiskey that we did, and it was just super different. Um, but it was it was more traditional and like a little bit closer to like a normal style whiskey that you would try. Okay, yeah. Is there, is there? I don't. So I don't know a lot about spirits. I'm mm-hmm. not a spirits guy. Is, can whiskey doesn't have to be aged ten years? Like you didn't have to start ten years before you sold your first whiskey. It can be. Okay. Um, so that's that was one of the biggest components of why I wanted to start the company was because I felt like that was just the common thought was hmm. that whiskey was it was basically better by based off of how long it's been aged for. Yeah. Whereas I wanted to showcase how the base ingredients that went into the spirit could showcase into different flavors and different styles of whiskey, Got it. which I feel like was just completely overlooked. Yeah. So um I mean, the rule of thumb that we would always use is like a gallon of, of, a, of a barrel equates to a month of age. Okay. So we started using smaller barrels. So we were using a five-gallon barrel to begin with. Oh, wow. And we were aging it for like four months. So really small volume, small batch at that point. S- super small volume, super yeah. small batch. So the first batch we did, um, we hired Mill Valley Beer Works, which is now Four Point. Okay. Um, but they closed Mill Valley Beer Works. But we hired them to brew us basically 300 gallons of a chocolate oatmeal stout with this peat smoke malted barley. They didn't have room in their fermenters, so they had us just provide our own tanks. Yeah. So I went on Craigslist and I bought some olive drums and I aged it, or I fermented it in those olive drums. Yeah. After it was done fermenting, I took that to Stillwater Spirits up in Petaluma, distilled it, brought that back to the city. It basically netted 30 gallons of whiskey, which is wow. six five-gallon barrels okay so oh i aged goodness. those six five-gallon barrels for like four to six months when it was done packaged it myself went yeah. out there sold it sold it made a profit and then came back and made double the size batch yeah yeah so okay. the next one was like 12 barrels and just kind of kept like going 18 yeah okay and then eventually got to the point where we started using your neighbors ej fair oh yeah yeah so we were using uh, in their them pittsburgh in facility? their pittsburgh facility yeah so we were Increasing it to like 15 <coughs> barrels and then 30 barrels and 60 barrels. And eventually, I think we got to the point where they couldn't keep up with us. So they wow. had to stop. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of skipping ahead a bit, right? Because you, you sort of went from, am I allowed to say that you kind of learned to distill at home? Like, is that? Yeah, okay. it is a federal offense. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can feel It's not like they're catching you doing it at this point. I'm just yeah, saying I the words. With it. <laughs> yeah. um, and then. You know, because I'm sort of reading through your your story, and and you you open up in some like what like tiny like commercially finally in some yeah. tiny garage or something it was in San a Francisco. Unit. It, was a, it was actual storage. It was like unit. a 400 square foot storage unit. Like like you that you pay like that like my storage unit with a bunch of antiques in it. Storage Pro SF. <laughs> oh wow! It was like. <laughs> But you licensed the facility? Yeah. Really? And you were you had your fermenters in there? No. We just, were so just we had a type it. seven, so we were rectifiers. So oh. we were contract brewing and okay. then we were contract distilling. Got it. And then we were renting a U Haul truck and taking the unaged spirits back to the city where got we're, it, got we're, it. we're filling the barrels on our own. Yeah. I see. We're aging it in San Francisco and then we're bottling it there. And then since we were a type seven rectifiers license, we can go out and do self distribution too. So then we're also our own salespeople. Right. So we're wow. going out there door to door slinging whiskey. Wow. Yeah. So that was what, like twenty thirteen? Yeah, that was twenty thirteen until twenty sixteen. Okay. Yeah. And right. then twenty sixteen was kind of the turning point for us. So that was when I had our first banker come in. Okay. Um, and he looked at the space and he was like, Oh, this is super cool like what do you need to take this to the next level i see and i was like i need a hundred grand to buy a still <laughs> and he was like let me see what i can do and like a couple days later he came back he got me a loan for a hundred grand and was it really that random like this wasn't some friend or something it was just kind of a random banker that took interest yeah really yeah well, that's cool I, well i reached out to him and like I, okay i must have met him at a trade show or something like that okay and I was just like, oh, yeah, we could use financing. But I didn't know anything about, like, how to do this or how to take out a loan or how to, like. Yeah. Yeah. I and still don't know. Yeah. It's. <laughs> you're <laughs> learning constantly. It's yeah, so yeah. weird. Yeah. So he comes up to money for a still, but he, you don't even have a place to put the still. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you're surprised. <laughs> but that's where he... this whole thing starts kind of snowballing because yeah. then you have to start figuring out the next steps. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it's at least the starting point. So we got the hundred grand for the still. And then I'm like, oh. I also need a brew house so I can make like the beer that we're going to use to distill. And then I also need fermenters. Oh, I also need a space. Right. Now we got to pay for construction. Um, yeah. So that's when I figured out how to do equity crowd e- equity crowdfunding, basically. Okay. So that one was kind of friends of friends. And I would go out and I would sell like a membership unit in the LLC that I had established. 
Okay. And then they would give they write me a check for twenty five thousand dollars or whatever, and I would use that for the construction. So it's like so it's shares, just like being a it's shareholder, like but, shares, more, but yeah. a little more private. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And 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 do you mind me asking, like, what do they get in return? What's the incentive for them? Like a share. Uh, just a share in the company. Yep. So if the company grows, like they'll get returns on that, whatever their shares are. So it's not like a g- ideally, yeah. In other words, it's not like taking a little loan from your friends and family that might want you know seven percent back. It's like you're buying a. It's like you're buying a share in Apple, mm-hmm. and that's why like I've done. So I've done two crowd like public crowdfunding raises so far, um, and we get the question a lot like, oh, what do I get for this? And I'm sure. like. What, what do you get when you buy a stock of Apple? Like, yeah. you think that they're sending you a little iPod or something? Like, you know, yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. buying an equity stake in their company, and if they perform well, yeah. then you're going to get a return on your money. Okay. It's just it's a little diff- it's a little different for this kind of thing because it's a private yeah. investment, so you're not able to, like, liquidate your shares. Or you can't whatever. just sell off. Yeah. Okay. So they have to wait until there's some other event. Exactly. Like, if okay. there's an IPO or something, so if we were listed on some kind of a public... Yeah. platform then you could sell your shares like there would just have to be a public method for somebody to be able to sell their equity and that would require like a public market for somebody to want to buy that equity so even those first investors and of course as we go through this interview we're going to find out how much you've grown so it's yeah. really really phenomenal um they're still just hanging on for the a future uh, a payout when something like an IPO happens exactly, or yeah. another way because there's probably other way if the company gets bought exactly yeah, yeah. i mean that's the big hope for everybody is it's sure. like you see the news about Ballast Point getting acquired for a billion dollars yeah, like, yeah. oh i'll throw in some money like yeah, was, hope for that yeah, yeah hope for that <laughs> yeah man. exactly when I can get my checkbook out. <laughs> uh, okay, so you do that sort of funding for your first brewery. For the first brewery, right? Yeah. And, and you end the up Bayview facility. Bayview, yeah. and you end up with like what, like a seven thousand square foot something or other. Bre- it was brewery. like forty four hundred. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it was a 4,400 square foot facility. And what size brew house? Um, that was a 15 barrel brew house. We started out with okay. two 15 barrel fermenters. And then basically, I, I don't know if you want to go into this now, but we added on beer in like 2018. Okay. So once we added on beer, basically all of our sales and the demand for the beer started growing faster than the sales and the demand for the spirits. Okay. So that also led to the requirement of us to have more space. Yeah. So basically in 2018, we added on nine 30 barrel fermenters. So we went wow. from two 15s to 930s and the 215s like okay and did you you had a tap room at that point yeah yeah did you open that facility with a tap room we did but it was more of like a craft liquor like spot so it was oh, basically yeah. it was a tight so that was a type 74 so our timing was perfect because the craft distillers license came into effect in 2016 like mm-hmm. right when we opened the Bay- bayview facility <clears throat> but the interesting thing about the type 74 which is yeah the craft distillers license is that you can serve tastings but you're limited on the amount of tastings you can serve. Yeah. So because it's liquor, they ba- they basically say you can serve up to 1.5 ounces of liquor per person per day. Oh, yeah. So we have all these people coming out to the Bayview, and they're able to have like six quarter ounce tasters, essentially. Mm-hmm. But then the ABC or the government or whoever is saying you can serve them a keg of beer if they want to drink it there. They could sit there and they can have 100 pints, but they can only have an ounce and a half of liquor. Right. Mm. So like... I started looking at all these customers who were coming in on the weekend. And it was getting super busy. And I'm like, why don't we sell them more stuff? Yeah. So it's yeah. like, why don't we start brewing beer at the same time? So you can come out here. You can do a, ta- a whiskey tasting flight. You want to stick around because you just took a $30 Uber down here. Like, have two beers. Yeah. Yeah. Which it, it continues to evolve things. So you're like, oh, you're going to have a food truck. Now we're going to have some small snacks inside. Right. And now we're going to start packaging our beers, selling four packs to go, selling six packs to go. And then all of a sudden we're a brewery, yeah. which was kind of the intention to begin with. So yeah. it did work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that totally worked. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's super interesting, but it, yeah, it did work. I love it. Yeah. All right, why don't we take a quick break? We've got a lot more to talk about, and we've got some more to taste, too. So you're listening to the session with Seven Stills, and we'll be right back after this quick break. Welcome back to the program. Thank you again for hanging out with us today. Whatever you're doing, driving, drive safe if you are, sitting, I don't know, working or should be working, quiet quitting somewhere. That's a thing, I think. I, I read <laughs> Being about. prematurely yeah. retired. <laughs> Thank you for listening to our to our show. We're still here with Seven Stills um, and learning about their fascinating story. 
I think I have a lot to learn from Tim. He seems to be making money, so that's a good thing. That's what I have to learn from Tim. Uh, or maybe just spending it all back on the company, which, you know, that I can do well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got a Pilsner in our glass first, though. Seven Stills Pilsner. And as Tim just told us, like, the beer kind of ended up secondary after the, the you know, first distilling mm-hmm. um, and, and then started, you know, making a bunch of beer and selling beer in the in the tasting room. Um, I did want to just point out or... or just give you kudos or something that from this uh, storage unit and self distributing and it going out there and like pounding the streets, you gained enough sales and reputation that you're like, Oh cool. Now we need a 15 barrel brewery. That seems like a, a massive step to me to go from the, the storage unit to a 15 barrel brewery. Thank you. But you guys were just what you're just out on the pavement every day, just pushing your, your, your spirits. We would drive to a neighborhood in San Francisco and we would park the car and take a bottle of vodka and we would walk down the street and we would see a liquor store and we'd walk inside and say, hey, do you want to try our vodka? Yeah. And they'd say, oh, awesome. It's local. Give us two bottles. And then we'd walk back to the car, bring them two bottles with an invoice. Wow. Continue walking down the street, go to a restaurant. Oh, cool. You want some vodka? Yeah, yeah, we'll take two cases, go back to the car, and keep on doing it. And we would just do that until we hit every place in San Francisco. Amazing. Um, yeah, and it got to the point where we eventually had, I think, like 200 buying accounts, and there was two of us. Okay. And then we started getting on the radar of distributors. So that's when, like, Southern approached us, and they're like, oh, cool, we would love we'll to buy. carry your brand, like, because we're seeing you all over the city, and everybody's saying, like, have you have you heard about these new guys who are making, like, vodka and whiskey? Yeah. Um, so it was really cool, because we got to basically go out there and pick the distributor that we wanted to work with, which... That's awesome. Yeah. Was what really a great cool. success story. But because of hard work, just like, we're just going to pound the pavement. Literally pounding the pavement. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever think about one of those trench coats with, like, bottle <laughs> right, yeah. holes? It was already super illegal to be selling it from our car, but that would have been... <laughs> right. That would have been great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Little flask. Can I get yeah. Well, then it, a shooter. It, it, I got whiskey on this side, yeah. and then Fox you on the other. Well, and it and it proved your your kind of theory, or at least what you wanted, because you thought, hey, just craft beer was just too busy, too saturated. So, you know, at the time that you started, you could have walked around to every place with your craft beer, but it people would have been like, yeah, there's a bunch of other San Francisco craft brewers. Maybe I'll try yours. Totally, yeah. But you were like, they were excited because you were unique in, yeah. in the marketplace. Yeah. So what a great premise to start with. You proved yourself right. Yeah. You know, and then got to go do beer later. Exactly. So yeah. <laughs> I love that. Cool. Well, tell us about the Pilsner. Uh, the Pilsner was inspired by a beer that I think we all tried at GABF one That's year, good. and then we all came back and decided to do the exact same thing. But oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have tried that, like, slow, poor Pilsner. I think it's called Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we have. But every single <laughs> person went to GABF, and they tried this beer, and they're like, this is so freaking good. Like, yeah. I'm bringing this back. So originally, this beer was called Slow Flow. Okay. And nice. it was like a Czech-style Pilsner that was meant to be poured and enjoyed slow <laughs> right so it was like super cool and we got all these like checks uh the check side pour handles i don't know if you guys yeah the oh, liquor yeah. faucets yeah, yeah exactly nice. so it was like oh you can aerate it and you can have like just the milk or you can have whatever and just mm. basically allowing people to drink this beer in a different way but the whole point was it's super creamy super refreshing easy drinking yeah yeah this is delicious yeah. and another one that's that's crushable just right out super of the can crushable, yeah 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 yeah, yeah totally uh, beer stat right yeah, is that the, yeah, I don't mind saying that. I think it's yeah. Beerstadt. Yeah. Yeah. We go every time yeah. Teresa and I are in Denver, we meet up at Beerstadt. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I last time I was in Denver, I literally was there every single day. <laughs> it's, it's just so it's good. Like, yeah. I'm so it's glad like it's like beer Disneyland mm-hmm. for me. Like yeah. I, I just I get all like yeah willowy whenever I Ashley like comes around. I'm, I love it. Yeah, so I'm going much. to Denver on Friday, so that's great. Oh, you got it. Yeah, and by the way, you're not the only. All the brewers know it. If you yeah, just mention, if you mention Denver and loggers to another brewer, oh, they're sure, all like, yeah. "Oh yeah, beer stat." Yeah, <laughs> yeah beer stat. Yeah. Everybody, we goes all there. we all faint with yeah, like envy just, and it's the mothership. Yeah, That's so all good. It's yeah. just water. Yeah, it's just like you're drinking like <laughs> yeah. delicious yeah. water. And all of their beers, by the way. But yes, their slow pour pills is number one. But all of their beers are really mm-hmm. amazing. Uh, yeah, this is hey, this stands up. This is a great pilsner. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, really well done. Yeah, it's super easy, um, and I don't know if we want to talk about like the change in strategy at all in terms of beers or that kind of thing. Yeah, but, I mean we we could. I, I love strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I basically, uh, 
I think that the previous model of like craft beer, like double IPAs, kettle sours, and imperial stouts has kind of died. Okay. <gasps> It died. <laughs> I'm so excited. No. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, we thought sorry. it was still on the way down, but okay. Yeah, yeah I think it's dead. Okay. You think it's dead? Well, so I get, mean, you've okay. been ahead of the game on some things. So, so what do you think? So I hope you're right. What's replacing it? Um, well, I think RTD is replacing it actively, ready to drink. But that's not that wasn't necessarily the point of like this analogy. But I think that more approachable styles of beer that are simpler are going to start replacing craft beer. Hmm. Um, I think that something really interesting happened during COVID, and I think that was because all of these hype breweries like the Humble Seas and like the Great Notions and the Russian Rivers, who used to be super hard to get, yeah. closed their tap rooms because COVID hit. And because they had all this excess beer, they started canning more of it, right. and they started sending it to different markets. And then all of a sudden, people started buying that beer instead of the local beers, which I think basically caused the local beers to start stacking up on the shelves, mm. which basically led the led the section, like the craft beer section in, like, say, any liquor store to grow from, like, one times the size to two times the size to four times the size immediately. Mm -hmm. And I think that the only way that you can really stand out in that crowd is by doing something that's louder and more noisy. Mm -hmm. So I think it led to a lot more, like, outrageous names, like, colorful packaging, like, all these things that were already synonymous with beer yeah. and like crazy styles of like cereal beers or whatever. And like just this weird stuff. And I think the chaos of all these people trying to stand out in the, in addition to the industry and this category growing from one X to four X, like in the, in a matter of like six months led to this just like overwhelming effect on consumers. Hmm. So when you're going to the liquor store and you're trying to pick out a four pack, you're looking at like all of this shit shit on yeah. the shelf and yeah. you're like I can't even think about this like I don't want to like have to think about what one of these beers I'm going to pick for my like night off or whatever I'm going to go buy a six pack of Kolsch okay I'm going to yeah. buy a six pack of Pilsner so all of a sudden I think we saw like if you if you talk to liquor store or grocery store owners we saw a shift to beers like Modelo mm. mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you see this market share moving towards macro brands like Modelo or even the people who are adapting like the Fort Points of the world who yeah. are making a Kolsch, like the KSA and a six pack, yeah. which evolves into a 12 pack. So I think a lot of the craft consumers started also drinking these macro styles of beer, which led to a decreased demand for these craft styles mm -hmm. while you get a market that's more and more flooded. Yeah, And I think it's just caused chaos in the industry and I don't think there's really any turning back from it. I see, hmm. other so, than to embrace it. Which is what we're trying to do, yeah. Okay. So what I did was I switched all of our model over to making six packs in 12 ounce ca cans. Really? And all approachable styles of beer. Okay. Hmm. So it's basically, I was trying to span the spectrum of styles based off of ABV. Mm -hmm. So I did a 4.2% apricot wheat beer first, and then the 4.7% Kolsch, 5.5% Pilsner, and then a 6.7% hazy IPA, which eventually turned into a West Coast IPA. I see. Yeah. Interesting. So I'm still doing this like hype can model at the same time, but that was completely what dominated everything we were doing pre-COVID because that's what everybody wanted was like this crazy new IPA, like whatever, like super hazy, super juicy, like yeah. whatever milkshake IPAs. Um, so I'm still doing that, but it's, it's just way less of the focus of the company. Sure. So it's like, that's, I mean, I feel like that's what people are buying like once a week now. Yeah. But what people are buying every day is like a light style that they don't have to think about because they want a beer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. See, and you're describing me as a consumer, but but I've sort of always been that way. Yeah. Right? So I'm not the person you're talking about. Which leads, So what I want to know from you, because I'm, I'm trying to think about exactly who you're speaking of with this shift. How many barrels a year do you think you're, you're going to make th this year? What, I, we're you... still small. We're probably doing so, like 5,000. Okay. Because I was thinking that this shift you're talking about, which I do see, but I see it on a on a more micro scale even, mm -hmm. that more small brewers like you are putting out pilsners, uh, hoppy pilsners. Like the, we're getting more lagers than we ever got, mm -hmm. and they're by the way they're more delicious than they ever were too. Um, but in my scene, we're still selling a ton of hazy, a ton of IP, and so is everybody else, right? So I'm wondering if like. But that's this shift you're talking about happened at the more mass scale and is still trickling down to the small brewer scale. Does that make sense? 
And you're planning for that, the future, I, I guess is what I'm saying. I think you're maybe a little biased because you have this spot. And like if yeah, you're yeah. talking about a spot like like this, like you're going to come here and you're going to want to try that That's what people are coming for. style yeah. of beer. Like you're not going to come seek out like a Pilsner here. Yeah. But like how often are you doing that? Like once yeah. a week? Yeah. And then how often are you drinking beer? Like five yeah. times a week? Right. Well, and my question right. for you is like how much are your of your beer is going in cans versus draft? It's accounts a lot of cans hmm. is it more cans than draft yeah okay and yeah, six it's, it's and like mostly six packs all six packs yeah. all six pa- okay yeah well so you said a few you're still doing some like we're tall, doing yeah. yeah we're still but, doing the four pack 16 ounce cans but it's yeah. all on a pre-sale basis so we're okay. basically like allocating cases to accounts and then if they want it then we'll send them like one case i see but it's more just to drive people to the tap rooms that we have in the city yeah to keep them excited about what's new mm-hmm. and to kind of build out like the tap list also yeah. yeah, which you still kind of as a tap room you still have to do, but you you're talking to, yeah. about on the shelf too is where exactly, is really your yeah. main yeah. Which for me on the shelf, yeah, I'm buying Sierra Nevada Pale Ale almost every time. I'm just looking for something simple, uh, not not that 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 is simple, but you see my point. I also don't want to think too much about it. If I want to think about it, I buy from myself. Yeah, I'll come here and that and you're right. That does only happen for me about once a week where I'm like, cool, let me grab a, a West Coast. Let me try this other thing. But the rest of the week, because I am still drinking, it's, yeah, it is it is more simplified. Uh, but like I said, I've just sort of, uh, I think I've always been that way. And I, but I, I can see your point that that's maybe growing out that way as well. I think something else happened at the same time. And I think that's <clears throat> that the majority of, the craft beer drinkers and like the craft beer or brewery owners are millennials. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that over the last couple of years, we've all gotten older. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. I think part of us all getting older has got us to start thinking more about what we're eating and what we're drinking. Yeah. And I hear this all of the time that people don't want to have an IPA or a hazy IPA because it makes them feel full. Yeah. Or fat. Yep. So they're going for a White Claw yeah. instead? I, I hear they brewers saying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a brewer that I respect so much. I won't say his name for his own sake because it's such this faux pas. But he's like, man, if I go out, I either need a light cocktail, maybe a cider, but it is not a big old IPA like I make. <laughs> no. Yeah. Because <laughs> of that same reason. He's like, I just feel real. And, you know, and, and I related. I was like, yep, yep, I feel that way. Plus the hangovers are worse. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's this evolution have... of the style, uh, the styles that we make. I think so, yeah. IPA is still king if you look at the, the sales numbers, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, not king over um, um, hard seltzers and, and, and stuff like that, but in the beer, in the craft category. Mm-hmm. But is it declining? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that, you know, I, I totally agree with a lot of what you said, but I think having less styles and focusing your energy and efforts into a few styles to distribute is Mm -hmm. really important. Yeah. So instead of distributing 15 things and always something new and different, like it really helps to have some core brands. Mm -hmm. That's definitely our strategy, which is kind of. But what's funny about that, Teresa, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just to hear you say core brands. Mm -hmm. I think it was just, just before the pandemic the word on the street was that core brands are dead. 100%. If, that the only yeah. people that are living off core brands are Sierra Nevada and New Belgium, and and the rest of you better come up with the next new thing or you're dying. Wasn't yeah. that what was being said? I know, and, and I, and think I don't right, believe though. them at all because our entire experience as a brewery is mm-hmm. that we do half of our production on one beer. Right. Literally one beer. Yeah. Which beer is that? It's called One Two Punch. It's a hazy IPA with peach and mango. Mm-hmm. It is. It's not the core of our brewery ethos, <laughs> but it's the, your but customer it base. Is like it's our most popular beer by a long shot, and yeah. we literally right now I can tell you it's in four of our tanks. We only have ten. Dang. Yeah. So yeah, it's well, we, and I think we there's... have been like that is whatever success we've enjoyed. It's definitely been because of doing a core beer like that and really building it up. Well, and here's where some of these theories like not fall apart, but they're hard to blanket. There is some locality to that. And, yeah. and I get to hear that from all the interviews I do with brewers. Like, oh, uh, my top selling beer is my uh, uh, corn-based uh, lager. 
Yeah. yeah. That's my top. Right. That's one person's very hyper local experience. Mm-hmm. And another hyper, your hyper local experience is that hazy. Yeah. And another one is, oh my gosh, we sell more red ale than anything. Yeah. And when I hear these interviews, I'm like, this is insane. How is it? How can it be so broad? You can look at the whole of the industry, which is what you were doing. And yeah. I, and I think you're right. Um, but yeah, then when you say hazy is like, and it's not going down, it's going up. That's also a hyper local thing for you, you know. Uh, not that yeah. hazy isn't popular everywhere, but no, no, you see I, my point. Yeah, that. Yeah, but I think just focusing your efforts. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's one thing. Like you, your sales has a message, and this is the message, and this is what we do. Mm-hmm. And and it also helps from a like sales standpoint because hopefully you're actually going to have enough of that beer to satisfy the customer totally, yeah. base. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you try to do 20 things you're always running out then like you're always letting someone down so how many do you have now tim like what is your core that you're focusing on there are four four yeah Yeah. okay yeah so it's the basically it's a rotating core is the first one so that was just the apricot wheat but we just replaced that with the hazy pale ale okay can we try that one is that what we have next yeah let's can you pour that Teresa? thank you um and then the lowest abv of the actual core is the kolsch which okay. is the 4.7 percent and then the uh, the czech style pilsner is 5.5 and then the west coast ipa is 6.7 got it okay so and so the west coast and you're doing the west coast ipa in six packs too like that's part yeah. of that whole core yep yeah see i like that too i don't buy and this is but, but i'm not your average craft beer drinker either i don't generally buy ipa by the six pack anymore I did a few years ago, but you can be sure I'm buying all my Pilsners, all my Kolsch's, and all my Pale Ales by the six pack. Mm-hmm. You can be absolutely sure of that. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so something else that you just said, uh, Teresa, rang true, but like we previously did our core beer was the Hazy IPA, mm-hmm. and that was our top selling beer by far, it was like 50 to 60% of our total gross sales and our, yep. total, our, our total production. And I made the move of killing it. And replacing it with our West Coast IPA. Oh wow! And then, and then I think it's working. <laughs> you don't know? Did this just happen? So I, yeah, it's been, okay. I did this. I killed our hazy double IPA and replaced it with a West Coast single. It's not working all that it's well. Not it's working. not working. Okay, yeah. Give it no. time. <laughs> I know. Right. I I love this beer, so I'm sticking with I it. I still love hazy IPAs. It's like that's like my go-to. That's my favorite beer. Like, okay. If I'm gonna go to a bar like yours. I'm gonna come and I'm gonna drink a hazy IPA. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think the consumer tastes are also sh- also shifting away from hazy IPAs, and I think they're shifting towards more approachable styles of beer, okay, like the West Coasts. Yeah. Um, well, and and you you really do have to think about that that consumer too, which clearly you're doing. I'm, I'm preaching the choir, but mm-hmm. one of the the like the most successful things about the hazy IPA was to. Uh, provide people who didn't like bitterness with a beer that has all the other things that they like, right? Yeah. So the classic styles, even a Pilsner, which I love, it's a bitter style, right? They're gonna, but, but maybe it's been a little palate training method with the hazies, mm-hmm. and now they'll transition to a little bit of bitterness. Because even these classic, you know, your Pilsner's got the right amount of bitterness, but it's bitterness. Yeah, for you know? sure. Uh, this pale ale, real quick, or not real quick. Okay, the aroma, and I hope this is a compliment. So fruity pebbles. Yeah. Super, super, I love super it. tangerine. Yeah. Gosh, do I love fruity pebbles. <laughs> so that I just be my nickname. I, candied orange. <laughs> Is that right? Can I should I call you that for the rest of the show? <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> They're gonna be like, this guy's from San Francisco with fruity pebbles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so I haven't even tasted it yet, but it just smells uh, perfect. Yeah. I'll use my cheat sheet again. Mm-hmm. Um Pilsner malt, aromatic malt, biscuit malt. Hops, um, CTZ, Simcoe, Wakatu, and then all Wakatu dry hop. It's not, mm. I said mm. hazy before, it's not hazy, it's a dry hop pale ale. Okay, got yeah. it. It's that, it's that Wakatu, I think, really, coming through. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. I'll have to try that a little more. So tropical. It's fruity. such a, such a oh good, God. it's, and just barely better, like, really nice beer. Yeah. I think it allows for the production of diacetyl in the beer, which is something that I really like as... Ah, an off flavor. Okay, um, so that's why like Almanac used to make a beer that was called like Waka Two <clears throat> Sour, and it was my favorite beer that they'd make. Okay, and it was because it had this this flavor that was super similar to like Pediococcus. Like I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's yep. got like this kind of like creamy, like um, it's almost like a diacetyl kind of little off slick on the to tongue it. too. Yeah, yeah, which is an acceptable like 
byproduct of that style of beer. So I really like that flavor and I really hmm. like that in that specific, I think just because that hop allows for that flavor to be produced. I see. Wh- what does that mean that it allows for it to be produced? Like it's uh, it's just that it's not an inhibitor of it? Like it, It's or, just a byproduct it meshes of the fermentation. It. So I don't know. I guess, I, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah. that's Because uh, I would think Maybe it allows it to taste more acceptable rather than, but I don't, I'm no brewing scientist. I don't, I don't get that flavor. Yeah. To me, that is a huge off flavor. It's a huge uh-huh. turnoff. You're and I, I don't get it, that. But you're not, yeah, I'm not tasting either. I am, I'm only moderately sensitive. Um, I have, I have put myself up against my brewers, mm-hmm. a couple of the brewers. And they are way better than me mm-hmm. and my mm-hmm. taproom manager. So I, I can't say it's yeah. not there, but I can't detect it. I think maybe I'm associating it more with the with the actual <clears throat> Wakatu Sour from Almanac. And okay. that's why I'm yeah. thinking that it's here. Mm-hmm. Because I definitely don't taste it at all. But no. it, yeah. it has that kind of like creaminess to it, which maybe is just like a correlation in my brain. of like, oh, I really like that flavor yeah, of Almanac yeah. beer. Um, this is a pale ale I would buy by the six pack it's for sure. super mm-hmm. good. Yeah, so this is... Uh, <clears throat> this is actually an interesting collaboration, but it's with an organization called Pangea Seed. Okay. Um, so this is something that we were just talking about a little bit, but I'm super into like uh, ocean conservation and just like generally the environment and giving back as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, so Pangea Seed is an org- organization that is helping with ocean conservation and they're doing a project with um, this group called Seawalls and the Seawalls project is going to be taking place in Emeryville. Okay. So basically it's spreading awareness about ocean conservation through artivism artivism okay yeah yeah so it's led by this guy this incredible artist named joey rose who designed the can for us um but they're basically doing these installs and these activations throughout emeryville in september and they're taking over like eight big walls in emeryville and doing like this big thing um but anyway a dollar from every six pack that we produce goes to their organization for this cause nice yeah so yeah, I like that. Putting yeah, your money where cool. your mouth is. Yeah, and then it's also we we can tie it into like this um, this effort that I started back in 2018 called Beers for the Bay. Okay, where I would go out there and I would just do like a cleanup. Um, so basically, I was operating in the Bayview, and it seemed like it was an area that was just super neglected by the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't originally. It wasn't like a thing that I was trying to market or anything. I just was super pissed off about the trash everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So all I did was when I, I went to Facebook. And I said, if anybody shows up and they help me pick up trash for two hours, I'll give you a free beer afterwards. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I just went down. I rented a U-Haul by myself. And then I went down to the brewery at like 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever on a Sunday. And there were like 50 to 100 people waiting outside to clean the streets with me. Wow. And I was like, this is insane. So that's uh, that's something that just kind of like continued spiraling into this effort that we eventually were doing like once a week and okay. cleaning up the bay or cleaning up the mission bay or doing like an ocean beach cleanup or something like that oh that's great yeah very cool yeah, yeah. i like to see people actually doing it because what is it greenwashing you're not greenwashing you're actually just going out there doing it yourself too yeah and i think it's it's more than just actually doing the work <clears throat> i think that there's a positive externality associated with seeing people on the street cleaning the trash mm-hmm. um and i think it was something that really resonated specifically specifically with the Bayview community because I feel like they also kind of had the sentiment that like their community was being overlooked. Mm-hmm. So when they would see a bunch of people going out there and cleaning the streets, they would be like, Oh, that's awesome. Somebody actually cares about our neighborhood. Yeah. And absolutely. Be like, Thanks for doing this. Like, and maybe it led to them throwing their trash away later or something. Instead sure. Of throwing it on the street. And it's so much better. We're, we're doing some cleanup efforts around here downtown and I'll go talk to the business owners to get involved, come to some of our meetings. And you know, the most common thing I hear is nobody's going to do anything. It's not going to make any difference. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I go to the meeting and we're like, we're making so many differences here. We're making so many strides. Every little thing but, like adds yeah. up. It's just... Yeah, I mean, that's why if you tie it to the ocean, I just feel like that's so powerful because yeah. if you think about removing a piece of trash from a street or whatever, like people don't really care. They're like, yeah, whatever, you're going to clean the streets. But it's like if that piece of trash is going to go into the ocean and it's going to potentially kill a turtle or a fish, yeah, that's powerful. And you're <laughs> like, I don't want that to happen. Like this is me causing this effect on the environment. And sure. Then, I don't know. Yeah. No, I agree. All right, we got a couple more beers to get through. I'm going to get us to another quick break. When we come back, we're going to learn about that. And then I want to talk, just even if it's briefly, you've had such this exponential growth, and we haven't even gotten fully to that. But I feel like a lot of it happened 
and then the pandemic hit. And that happened with so many, but you were on this kind of trajectory. And I thought, if you don't mind, maybe just talking about that for a few minutes when we come back. Sure. Yeah. All right. Hang in there. You're listening to the session. We've got Tim Obert from uh, Seven Stills in here with us, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for hanging out with us here on the session. We've got uh, Tim from Seven Stills in the studio. Teresa's with me. Uh, we're trying through some of their beers and learning about their very cool story. Got their West Coast IPA in front of you there, Teresa. And then we've got some of your, I don't know, soon to be not gone 16 ounce cans, or you'll always just have them there to kind of it's still bring in some excitement for the beer nerds. For the beer nerds, yeah, 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 I call I call it the beer connoisseurs. I don't the like beer that word. yeah. We, so I've been doing it long enough, and I'm a self proclaimed beer nerd that I'm allowed no. to. You don't have to do it, but it just sounds bad. My <laughs> sales director always calls it like the nerd bars, and I'm like, it's not nerdy. It's cool. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I embraced it early on. I was like, I don't care. Yeah, nerds. We're from, call me what you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're right. You're right. Um, we try not to be, we certainly here at my bar, try not to be snobby, snobby about it yeah. either. If I catch my, my team do anything like that, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what we do. Cool. Yeah. We show everybody about beer. And if all they want is a Modelo, then offer them something close and don't, we don't shit on that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, my, my team knows that, but I'm just saying every now and then you get a little, little grumpy bartender and you're like, hey, 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 come on. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be a beer. The worst thing you could be is not a beer nerd. It's a beer snob. That's that, the worst. Beer that, elitist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, don't do that. I I am actually a beer snob. Yeah. I just like keep it on the inside. <laughs> right. I yeah, don't yeah. let it out so yeah, other people know. Too. You know. In some ways, you know, most brewers are are beer snobs, but it doesn't mean yeah. that they don't drink that they don't love a Modelo um, or or some other kind of uh, Mexican lager or even a Coors Light or whatever it might be. It doesn't mean that. It just yeah. means the standards are high for every single beer they drink. Don't, I, isn't that what you mean about it? But you being an inside beer elitist. Well, yeah, I mean, like ha- being a beer snob means that if you have a beer that you don't love, you're not going to drink that beer. Like you'll, mm-hmm. you will struggle and pour that out. Right. You know? Okay. Like yeah. that, that is, you're just not going to drink that beer. But I've had so many Miller High Lifes in the presence of other brewers. Like, yeah, I would never drink that many of those beers myself, but we right. all get together. And that's what's up. We're at the bar late. Yeah. Yeah. So in that, if, if you define it that way, I guess I'm a beer uh, snob, except um, I will talk about how I don't like the beer, but I will mm-hmm. gener- generally finish it, and that just comes from my poor upbringing. Like, and not by poor, like my parents raised me poorly. Like, but P O U R, which is broke. <laughs> that I'm like, yeah, but I'm still good. I bought it, so I'm going to finish it. I don't even think it's like a poor upbringing. It's more of just being like, I mean, for me, it's more like stingy. I'm just like, I don't wanna, yeah, yeah. I don't want to waste this beer. I'm not going to waste it. Like, I don't like oh, it. Oh, I don't know. All, but I'm going to drink it. It has to be. I mean, I've dumped some. I'm sure you have, too. It has to be real it bad. It has to be bad. Yeah. yeah, it has to be, like, just awful to not drink it. Otherwise, it's like, well, I hope the next one's better. But I'll finish this. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, uh, all right. Well, tell us about the, the, the West Coast. What, what hops do you like to use in your core West Coast IPA? This... Okay, so I just told you guys about the the transition from the hazy. Oh, right, to this one, yeah. To this one. So this is the exact same beer. That's that, okay. But, oh, oh, but just, it's not hazy. Just oh, no as the yeah. West Coast. As a West Coast. I have done this many times. You have? Yes. I wanted to do some kind of a play off of like, because the original hazy IPA was called Five Pounds, which was called Five Pounds because we used five pounds of mosaic hops per barrel. Uh, and I wanted to do a play off of that and, do, and call this like West of the Five. Or something because it's like also like the West Coast is like very like SoCal and like SoCal is all about like the five and yep. whatever. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, so this is five pounds of mosaic hops per barrel in West Coast IPA form. Mm. Okay. And you just filter the shit out of it? Is that the difference? Or how do you get why biofine, is it? Biofine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's the difference it's in not the haze. Like, yeah, use some biofine and then it's not like super aggressively dry hopped. Okay. Yeah. Got and it. are you, but you're using a different yeast? To make this beer, right? It's USO01. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, so you can... So I guess, can, yeah, it's just the yeast, basically. It's really... But that'll make a big difference, won't it? It doesn't oh, yeah. taste like you're hazy at all, does it? I haven't tasted it, so I haven't it just... Does, get, it but does I'm guessing. Make, I, well, in my experience, it does make a huge mm-hmm. difference. Oh, I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good beer. That is very mosaic-focused on uh, my palate. 
That's what I'm getting. I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice one. All right, we've got some others that we we're, this is our last segment, so we got a, a bit of time left to do. Um, okay, so before the break, I kind of said, hey, I just wanted to at least talk a little bit about you know COVID and and your your trajectory. So you opened a a, a very large, very awesome uh, facility in in Mission Bay, yep. part of San Francisco, in 2018. Is that right, or earlier than that even? No, we started working on it in 2018. Okay. And San Francisco is a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, so it took it took two years for us to get the restaurant and the tap room and the cocktail bar open. Wow. So I got that spot open in November of 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah. Okay. Well, it probably wasn't terrible in November. <laughs> November was <laughs> through through, our best through month February. Of our entire company's history. Yeah. December was our best month oh and you're like feeling good you're like oh this gamble's paying off oh yeah it's also (laughs) i mean for me it was really important to stay in san francisco because our whole company is really rooted in san francisco and it's like the seven the seven stills for the seven hills of san francisco like yeah i want to have the brewery here um so we built it there it was a gamble because you know it's really really stupid expensive Hmm. to operate in san francisco and everybody's like why would you open a production facility in the middle of the most expensive city in the country at the time yeah um but i was like oh well we're in adobe's headquarters so adobe has the top three floors of our building so we've got a built-in customer base of 2500 employees upstairs okay yeah so you did (laughs) <laughs> oh man okay so you go like gangbusters it's a good thing to do and and but yeah real estate's expensive there labor's expensive it's, you know the whole thing so good they were obviously asking you valid questions okay but then 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 covid hits and we all just sort of experienced that right? yeah we can gloss over the abc thing if you want yeah that's fine which is what that getting we, your license you mean yeah well getting our license suspended for 90 days but then that oh. led into covid Oh, so do you the not timing, want to talk about? I don't know what happened I, with that. I mean, I it was I was pretty public about it, but oh, I, oh. I lost my license for ninety days for Tide House violations. Oh. oh wow! Yeah, so that started in February of twenty twenty. Got it. Wow. So you had oh, some cash goodness. reserves or something to make it through even that. That's rough. Or you just by the skin of your teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. <clears throat> yeah. So that was February was supposed to end in May, but then COVID hit on March sixteenth. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I my listeners are going to be mad at me if I don't. Sorry, the accidental tide house or, or like this is a whole no, it thing. Wasn't like, intentional. Tide house. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming. Is. Otherwise, you wouldn't even. You'd be like, nah, I'm a criminal. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> like that's yeah. not what happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. There was a there was a lot, and basically, once the ABC decides to start poking around, they start poking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, find all the things. Yeah, and they yeah. found a lot. Every okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so they so they do ninety days, no production, no selling. Is that what it is? Like you just so can't... they were super cool about it, and they let us keep the beer that we had produced in the tanks and our fermenters in the Bayview facility and continue packaging. Okay, but we couldn't produce any new beers for ninety days. Okay, so I basically just knew this was going to happen, so I stockpiled beer in the tanks. Mm-hmm. Got and I planned to package down, but then COVID hit, and then and then now you have all this product too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then COVID's like this sort of roller coaster of open, not open, open, not open. Well, yeah. And that's what I was kind of telling you beforehand. It was super interesting because we, so we had the Bayview production facility, which was operational and now full of beer that I was planning to start packaging for the next 90 days so I could have something to sell. The first facility. The first facility. Yeah. And the second facility was not operational. Okay. So we hadn't produced any product there. And then COVID hit. And then basically when COVID hit, I realized that there was this massive shortage for hand sanitizer, which is what I was telling you about before. Oh, yeah. Before and I realized that, that the biggest, um, one of the biggest ingredients in hand sanitizer is alcohol, which we all know about now. Mm-hmm. But I basically figured it out, I think, before a lot of people did. Um, okay. So I started experimenting with it. And it was really, it was more of like a, a philanthropic effort, I guess. So I was trying to like partner with other people so we can get the product out to like nursing homes and hospitals and stuff like that. So we were experimenting with making hand sanitizer before it became a thing and before the CDC like started allowing distilleries to make hand sanitizer. Yeah. So I was already like three steps ahead of everybody else. Okay. Um, so I had already been like prototyping it, like figuring out how to make like production hand sanitizer. And then Kaiser approached us. Okay. 
and Kaiser was like, "Hey, we're looking for like distilleries who are making hand sanitizer. Like, do you think you do you think you can make like ten thousand bottles for Wow San Francisco?" And I was like, "Yeah, no problem." And I think because I reacted so quickly, they escalated it. Okay, <laughs> and they were like, "Oh, these guys can make ten thousand bottles, so they can probably make more." Yeah. So then they took it to Kaiser National. Oh wow! Okay. So then I got the national contract for hand sanitizer for Kaiser. Wow. So basically, we had this brand new production facility, this 500 seat restaurant that we just opened three months prior. Yeah. And I shut the entire thing down and converted it into a hand sanitizer production facility. Right. And I was buying literally like container loads of plastic bottles from China, like sight unseen and like just get it here. Yeah. And the supply chain issue just exploded at the same time. So I was just buying whatever I can get. Yeah. Just trying to keep up with the demand for the product. But yeah, it was super weird because it's like the first product we made from our brand new like state of the art facility is freaking hand sanitizer. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think, though, that that either helped or is the reason you survived through that period? It's the only reason we survived. Yeah, Yeah. it was just that. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, So in addition to like, in in addition to selling it to Kaiser, we were selling it locally if we had any extra. And then I was basically able to bring like our restaurant workers back in. So like our bartenders and our servers and our runners, and we had them like literally either making it or driving their personal cars around and dropping it off and doing like DoorDash or Uber Eats or whatever. But it was like four hand sanitizer. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. So it was like two months were like our most successful months in our company's history. Right. Of hand sanitizer. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? So bizarre. It, it, it's, it's a great so story weird. and and it's part of our it's part of our culture now. Like at least all of us who are alive are, are going to talk about this forever. Totally, you know what yeah. I mean? Mm-hmm. So I would. There's nothing to be, uh, not that you seem like you are, but there's nothing to be ashamed about there. Just not obviously what you planned for your new uh, beautiful brew house. Yeah, but it saved us <laughs> distillery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's and that's a lucky thing for you. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's really that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, everything's open. And how how is that location doing now uh, from the on the public front? It's um, good. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. getting there. Um, it's a I restaurant think, and, and everything? Yeah, yeah, it's a big restaurant, a cocktail bar. It's got a yep. bottle shop and like a, like beers to go and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was expecting it to be a lot better mm-hmm. because we were so reliant on that tech business that's now just left San Francisco permanently. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the sales are still good. We're like basically now approaching like 2019 levels. Okay. But I was expecting them to be like three times as high yeah. by this point. Yeah. So. But those people, I mean, this whole work from home thing is not going to stay like it is now. I do think there's always going to be this like hybrid model, but people people are going to return to offices. Tech is going to return. Uh, if not tech, something else, green tech, like you name it. I'm not saying it's going to happen in the next year. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, it's this this can't go on, this model that we have right now. Uh, at, the status quo doesn't really work either. You're going to uh-huh. see some sort of hybrid of what you have now, I think. It's my theory. You can't just let entire downtown cities shrivel up and die, right? That's just not, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you're pretty optimistic. I, I think there's so much technology advance as far as people working from home. Like mm-hmm. I've I've worked tech jobs remotely and it's pretty awesome. Like, yeah. It is. It, it doesn't it doesn't even really feel like you're totally remote because everybody you can get to everybody so quickly and so easily. Yeah. I just think the cracks are starting to show because yeah. of the uh, speed of that adoption because look it existed before you had it before mm-hmm. right uh, you know Zoom existed well before but there were reasons we didn't adopt it like so quickly and I, I just think that there's a lot of cracks in the fast adoption of it uh, mental health getting out like you know working with others in person and I just think even productivity will start to I'm not saying you can't be productive working remotely um, you can Um but not everybody can. That's just a fact. Not everybody can be their own coach or boss or whatever. Yeah, that's true. You I know. mean, I, I have stories of <laughs> running my mouse while I'm doing something <laughs> altogether different over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think we'll get a, a different um, uh, um, uh, views on what productivity means and, and how and what the hours it needs to so that's why I'm saying there's going to be a hybrid have you ever read the four hour work week I based my life on it for a while 
Yeah. And you know, like this, this like idea of working for the sake of working. Yeah. I feel like it's just, that's one of the cracks that's starting to show. It's that so many people are realizing that you're wasting so much of your time just because you're working for the sake of working. Mm -hmm. So I think that this idea of working remotely is just unveiling that. And it's like, you don't have to sit here and work for eight hours. Like you're just doing that because that's the status quo. Right. It's like you can get your work done and then go do something else and come back and do some more work. Absolutely. Or yeah. Not or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's like, to me, it's incredible because I'm now living in San Diego, running a brewery and distillery in San Francisco. It's right. It's just like. Right. And everyone's like, how are you doing that? And I'm like, Google meetings. Yeah. Yeah. I have calls with my team. It's an eight hour drive. I come up here a couple times a month. Like totally. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that even Tim Ferriss, I think would agree that not everybody takes the initiative or has the ability to take the initiative. Maybe he wouldn't say they don't have the ability. He would say they don't to, to make that effective. Yeah. Right. So, and there were examples before this, right? So like, I think this is either in the four hour work week or some example from Tim Ferriss, but Best Buy tried this mm -hmm. with their offices. Obviously, your retail outlets, everyone's got to show up for work. But on the uh, executive side and the office side, um, we don't care when you show up for work. You have a cubicle. All we care about is that you get your work done. So go ahead and make your own hours and get your work done. Yeah. And after two years, they scrapped the entire program mm -hmm. because they found that people, many people, are just not good at managing their own time. They never, whether they weren't trained too well enough or it was too abrupt of a change, which is what I'm getting at with what happened with remote work. It was too abrupt of a change to adapt to that new model, right? So that's why all I'm saying is I think you're going to have a partial float back to those offices around your seven stills being more full, um, not a hundred percent float back, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of my impression of how things are going to go. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, Amazon acquired Whole Foods, and now they're rolling out their palm scanning technology in all the stores in San Francisco this year. Oh, is that right? Yeah. See, that's tech coming back. <laughs> but I mean, is there a point of having retail workers at that point? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Right. Yeah. So it's like, why would you have a retail worker if you could have your food delivered by drone and then you can scan your palm at the grocery store? You're right. The robots are But there's are still, like, so many people want to live in San Francisco. The roofs, the rents are going through the roof. Like, yeah. I don't It's It's so interesting. So what would you do with your 500-seat restaurant? Like, if you could Figure just... Figure out how robots need beer. Changes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. self-growing or something. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, no, no oh, the I, actual robot workers. What are they? What products what do, do they need? What robots want? Oh my god, <laughs> that's what I think is robot the real juice. future. <laughs> Maybe yeah. you could just have like robots to deliver <laughs> beer and food to people in their in their right. homes. I bet Tim's already doing that. That's what he that's probably my, is. My, my feeling. He's not going to tell us, but that's already in his ten year plan. Yeah, he's, this in the he's one step ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll edit this part out. Yeah. It's in Tim's rider that anything about ten years down the road, I have to omit from the podcast. Not me and Elon, <laughs> don't include it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think there's always going to be a need for restaurants and bars and hospitality because people just naturally are social beings, and they're going to continue to want to go out. And like, especially like in a city like San Francisco, like the tech and like the corporate offices are not going to just, they're not just going to go away. Right. So they're yeah. going to still want to do their corporate parties and their corporate gifting. So it's like, it's always, there's always going to be a need for this, but I think it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I had this discussion with some of the other day, even with, you know, you also can't go 100% remote you always need a meeting space in your in your company. It can't always be on Zoom. How, you know, all all hands on training can't always be done remotely. You you sometimes have to be together. And this is why I think I have hope for like I'm I'm happy that the workforce is evolving. I think that and that's a necessary and COVID helped us realize that. But I'm um what am I? I'm I'm, I'm optimistic that it will evolve. It will eventually start to evolve in a way that we can manage, because just flipping it upside down, kind of, I don't know. We are still seeing those pains, but yeah, we got to be able to come back from that and be productive again. Well, it's you know? like it's and it's got to work for everybody's model. It's like we had an earthquake, and now we keep having aftershocks, and yeah, each yeah. one is like causing a lot of creativity to be needed by people who run a small business. Yeah, you know? right. 
But how, and, and yeah, that's going to, this, this sort of endless, like, as a small business owner, we're on this treadmill, right? Mm-hmm. This constant treadmill right now. Eventually, we got to be able to step off the treadmill and watch the things that we did work. And then we'll get back on the treadmill. That's the nature of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. But since, what? I even forget now. March 2019. <laughs> that fucking treadmill won't turn off. And I think that's the sort of evolution we have to see like where it sort of goes a little bit backwards as we move forward. I don't know how else to really say it from the workforce perspective. But that's me mostly hoping a bunch of office people are around your new seven stills. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) it's either that or you just have to figure out how to adapt. Yeah. Which I think is the most important part. And like, to use your analogy, it might be important to think that maybe you shouldn't be on the treadmill and maybe you should get off and get on a bike. Yeah. Or something like right. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe you're just going to burn yourself out by staying on the treadmill, and you should try something different. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm bringing hard seltzer into my my bar, there you go. <laughs> which we talked about off air. But yep. uh, but that's happening, and that's why yeah, like we're I mean we're making the whole shift to RTD and to canned cocktails because yeah. I think that it's important to stay ahead of the curve, and even though I do think that this. Like this whole ready to drink canned cocktail thing could be a fad. I think that if it's applied like craft beer was applied like 10 years ago, it could be something that could be staying around for generations. Yeah. So yeah. you guys are about to uh, release uh, canned cocktails from Seven Stills. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, See, cool. I don't, I, I'm optimistic about this one too. I don't think it's a fad. I think it's such a fantastic idea and that they're so good. I mean, I've had some, at first I'm like, okay, here we go. It's like truly in a, in a, you know, it's going to yeah. be something that I don't really enjoy. I'd rather somebody actually make me a cocktail. And you know what? I've been proven wrong time and again on this canned cocktail. Some of them are great. Yeah. Some of them are very good. But I think the hardest thing is that there is this giant barrier to entry to start a distillery, which is required to, to make a canned cocktail. Yeah. That the space is being dominated by macro players. Mm. Okay. Which I think is going to just stall all creativity, which is why I think that there's a potential that it could be a fad. Yeah. But that's also why I'm super optimistic about what we're doing, which is applying the craft to this canned cocktails, which is growing so quickly, so fast. And you're making the spirit. Exactly, yeah. Right. And then what about the other mixes that are going into it? Like, what what are you going to make? What's going to be canned? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm trying to keep it super simple. Okay. So, like, the whiskey highball is going to be our biggest one, but that's our choco smoke whiskey. Okay. And it's literally choco smoke whiskey and soda water. Okay. <laughs> wow. It's a highball. It's super basic. It's 10%, but it's, like... Nice. This is meant to showcase the spirits. Yeah. And, like, that's how we're trying to apply, like, the craft of what we're doing to this new industry Mm -hmm. so it's like yeah we're making craft spirits and we're using those to make our canned cocktails versus being like yeah we're buying it because it's convenient but it's made by absolute or gray goose or sure or jose cuervo or whatever yeah 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 okay so but that's not the only one you're making is it are you making no so we're making uh we're rolling out three right now so we're basically i'm seeing this the rtd the spirits based rtd market forking so it's going in two distinct directions the first is uh, canned cocktails, so that's the Moscow Mule, which is, sorry, it's not called a Moscow Mule, it's called a Vodka Mule. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then a Whiskey Highball, and then we'll be adding a margarita on once we get our licenses to start producing tequila in Mexico. Okay. Uh, and then the other side is the seltzer, but the seltzers are spirits-based seltzers. I see. Yeah. Instead of ferment, uh, ferment yeah, okay. Yeah, so things like High Noon, um, so that's a watermelon vodka seltzer. Okay. So it's 5%, 100 calories, no sugar added, like super simple, super easy to drink, but it's made with our vodka. I see. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I don't I think that that category is... I've had people come in here and say like kombucha is next. I'm like, no, I don't I don't see that. I don't see that happening. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, canned cocktails was the fastest growing category pre, pre-COVID and then COVID just took it into the mainstream okay yeah so it was sub 1 billion in 2019 and then it's basically grown to 4.5 billion now oh, wow. Wow. in the u.s yeah 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 it's huge what was the one um it's still out there it's a huge one that was part of ballast ballast cut water cut thank you oh, cut yeah, water yeah. and then they made the brilliant decision i heard at the last minute to not sell cut water along with ballast and then later sold that one for another chunk of change and I'm just like, oh, you boys, you're smart over there. You guys knew what was up. It's a Budweiser, yeah. Yeah, who, who, who was, who, what little man from the future, person from the future, I should say, was like whispering in their ear about Yeah, they, uh, they probably had an actual man from the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. 
I can tell you, uh, there's a, so in my area, um, the can van is, well, and they work down here too. Yeah. I mean, they, they can um, beer, but they started a whole business based on canning RTDs and canned wine. It's called Tank Space. Okay. So you can bring your, your beverage there, put it in a tank and they'll can the hell out of it and you just go pick it up. Totally, yeah. So it's, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, they they expanded into a whole new facility to do that. Right. But that's a really interesting point. So, like, everything that you're seeing on the market right now in terms of the canned cocktail space is either being made by a macro player or it's being made by a co-packer. Hmm. Uh, huh. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't want to necessarily say that I have a problem with that. Like, I love the can van and everything they do. But, like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> the... All of these people who are making a canned cocktail by using a co-packer are basically charging a premium for their product because they're adding an extra layer onto the system. Yeah. Yeah. So then you're thinking that you're getting a higher quality product like it would be made from a craft distillery because you're paying more for it. I see. When it's not necessarily premium quality. Yeah, but uh, that's the same problem that every brewery runs into that doesn't have their own canning line. Yeah. But they don't have anything, right? What do you mean? If you make your product with a co-packer, you don't have anything. Well, you had a fermenter and you put all the stuff together and you trucked it to them and then put it into theirs. Like it's, they're not, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, but I believe. So your product is what you're saying. Yeah, I I believe they're just bringing it there and putting it into their tank so that they can carbonate it and, and package it. I see. So maybe I'm not right about that? No. They, okay. Yeah, they produce it all there. Just You're talking about specifically with canned cocktails? Yeah, at Tank Space. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I've been looking into their programs also. Because they, I don't know, maybe you're right. Maybe they offer that service also. But. Well, and I mean, for for wine, definitely, like, you know, it's it's winery. Yeah. They're not fermenting the wine. They're they're not. So they truck the packaging. wine in. Yeah. 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 Okay. Exactly. Huh. Which, bre- you know. On some scale, brewing has been done too, but not not really. But yeah, well, yeah. And, and part of part of their model is like it has to move through quickly. Yeah, if, yeah. if it's a problem for them, if the you know space, you bring your yeah. stuff and you don't pick it up right away, like it gets packaged, but they're like yeah. the packaging is their deal. So, but you're saying by that you but just prefer that, doing it all on yeah, site. You just want to you want to do it all yourself, and yeah, because I think that we're getting into we're getting into this category that's either a big player or somebody who's making it at a big player not to yeah. say tank space is a big player but there's like the bigger can cocktail companies aren't actually like a distillery who's making a spirit that they're using to make uh, a cocktail yeah. yeah they're taking a recipe for a cocktail and they're taking it to whoever's already making white claw on high noon and they're having them make it there and because they're paying these this extra step of the process then they're passing it on to the consumer and they're thinking like oh this is a 17 dollar four pack it's got to be a craft product but it's like it's mm, not they're just paying not necessarily yeah, yeah. i see having blurry camera issues at the same time we're blurring the lines of this canned packaging product <laughs> i'm being i'm being told <laughs> well and, and so i mean you're thinking about this in the same way you thought about spirits it's like is it really craft because you're making like the the thing that just makes the most alcohol and then you're aging it but yeah i mean honestly it, it, your your approach makes sense yeah and we'll make the most money let's be honest yeah. about that <laughs> Yeah, that's you something put else a, I was going to say when you were talking about seltzer earlier. I was like, if you start talking about vodka, that's a different game. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know what the cost of a bottle of vodka is? Yeah. It's like 50 it's, cents. Right. I know. The spirits game, is, which I think is why so many uh, smart brewers, and luckily, in my opinion, brewers who are also interested in distilling, not just like the money. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's really, I think brewers learned over the years as they were toiling away for minimal profits, looking at the distilling world going, wait, you made what? <laughs> you can make what on that? But I think it's yeah. way more competitive. Yeah, okay, yeah. I Especially see. in like the vodka game, because they could be like, oh, you have to buy 500 cases of rain vodka to get your one bottle of Pappy Van Winkle this year. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We've had some of that with beer here on the retail front, like different distributors. Yeah. Um, oh, like holding you over a barrel to get yeah, that one like special years beer ago, that it you doesn't, want? It doesn't have any more, but years ago it was like, we, if we want a Cantillon, which I always, you know, like I spent years promoting that 
that brand on this program because I just loved it. And then when I opened a bar, I'm like, cool, we're going to get that. And whoever the distributor was at the time, not the same distributor, was like, um, yeah, no, that's no problem. We'll get it to you as soon as you buy X amount of McKellar. And I was like, uh, yeah, you know, not, not a real big fan. So I guess I won't serve Cantillon. And that's kind of how it went. That sucks. Yeah, I was really upset about it. Not upset enough to change my ethos. I was like, fuck you. I don't do pay to play. Fuck that. Yeah, that's, that's not, not cool. happening. You're not running my business for me. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing this. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not as successful as others either, so maybe my ethos don't, are, don't always help me. But I was just like, no, 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 no. I just, that's not, a, that's not something I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, my, yeah, my idea that was in regards to that was to give bar owners a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle if they bought our vodka. Right, yeah. So I'm like, what do you want? Like, you want this super allocated vodka or super allocated whiskey? Like, here you go. Yeah. It's 200 bucks. No problem. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, here's your Cantillon. Like, yeah. That's what I found. I th- so we got bottles that we couldn't we couldn't get kegs. But, uh, yeah. That's just my example. We, uh, Cantillon is a special place in our heart here. And the other thing I did was, um, so we did get bottles. That's right. But, and we're allowed to sell stuff to go. Mm. But everybody else around had, since I started drinking Cantillon before I opened this place, had increased their pricing of these bottles by like a thousand percent. So before I knew it, you know, I used to pay, you know, 30 bucks for a bottle. And I don't mind paying what stuff's worth, obviously. Uh, But by the end, I was paying like $85. So when I opened and I got the case price of it, I was like, Whoa! Where's this eighty-five dollars coming from? Nine hundred dollar case. Yeah, yeah which isn't the rude. case. The case price is way cheap, and so retailers, due to the popularity of it at the time, um, which I will go out on a limb and say I was part of, because we just did talk. We had so many listeners and talking about that all the time. Um, they were just raising the prices because retailers can do whatever the fuck they want. There's yeah. we can price anything we want. Um, so I made a rule. I was like, nope. We put the same margin on all of our Cantillon as we do everything else. There's no separate margin just because a beer is popular. I refuse to do that. But the rule we made was you can't take it to go. Because I didn't want motherfuckers buying it for me for forty dollars and, and selling it, it for eighty five dollars. Yeah, oh, so I was yeah, like, yeah. if you want, I what I want is for everybody to be able to enjoy, to enjoy great beer. And you have to give half of it to me. And, you, <laughs> and that <laughs> was the other rule. Yeah, yeah the other rule. for every <laughs> bottle we sell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I met John Van Roy at Swansea Day. Oh, nice! In like twenty eighteen. Yeah, it was so crazy. Oh, I went wow. over and I introduced myself to him, and he was talking to the mayor of Brussels at the same time. And he's like, "Have you met the mayor?" And oh, that's like, that's great. What is happening right now? Yeah. This is so crazy. Uh, he's great. And what he's done is great. And I'm gl- and the American market has helped him stay alive. Totally, you know, yeah. I'm glad. But he's not getting the $85 a bottle. He's got his getting posted seven, price, yeah. you know? Uh, so anyway. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, we're... We're short on time. For sure. uh, this has been fantastic. We have to have you back because I feel like we well we didn't even get through all the beers. Uh, we've got so much more to talk about. Uh, but you can go to sevenstills.com. I have that right. Yeah, sevenstills.com. You can learn more about uh, about the brewery and distillery. Uh, you can find out about their locations. Are both locations still open? They are. Yeah. So you still have Bayview and uh, Mission Bay. Oh no! Bay. So the Bayview's gone. Bayview's gone. Okay. So I lost the Bayview during COVID, but we still oh, have did. the Mission Bay facility and yeah, yeah, the okay. Outer Sunset Tap Room. It's okay. Forty third okay. Lawton, but that one is just beer, and it's like a super small, like no frills tap room kind of thing. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, we're gonna see canned cocktails coming out when? Next week. All right. As Whoa. early as next week. Yes. Oh man. Yeah. Oh. You must cusp? be stressed out right now. You got a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> what That's else did so Tim? Close. What else did Tim Ferriss say to do? Read fiction before you go to bed so you could fall asleep easily. <laughs> yeah. You got There's a lot of things he I've did for people stuff, like yeah. you and me. You got to do. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I wish you luck. Um, the beers are tasting uh, really fantastic. Thank you. Um, I now consider you, whether you like it or not, kind of a mentor of mine. I'm going to keep following your career. I think you have a smart view uh, of what's happening, and you've clearly shown that with the growth. And yeah, you took me a little bit by surprise today talking about the four core brands and the six packs and by surprise i mean like oh yeah that totally makes sense and i don't think i thought that far uh, about it so i'm really enjoying uh, learning from you man cool thank you thanks for having me yeah absolutely sevenstills.com you can learn everything all right Teresa, we done I think we're done. All right. We got a couple shows coming up. Um, what's our next show? Uh, next Wednesday, 
uh, White Labs East Company is coming on the show with us. So we're going to be talking to Chris White, um, which is always fun, but um, don't tell Chris this. Honestly, I'm a little more excited that Kara is coming on the show. Yeah, Kara's the bomb. She's a badass. I and I, in my opinion, she kind of runs the show around. Like she knows what's up. Yep. So Kara's going to join us from White Labs, too. Uh, maybe a couple others. So we're going to hang out. We're going to talk yeast. They've got new yeast packaging. I guess it's new like by a year or so now. And um, discuss all that stuff. All things beer with White Labs. I'm taking them to the baseball game first. So I apologize in advance if oh. we show up slightly less than sober. Yeah. Well, you know, that's encouraged. <laughs> well, I won't <laughs> show a up time. a lot less than sober, but I might show up slightly less than sober. Well, I will do my best to catch up. Yeah. You might have to come have a couple beers first. All right. <laughs> uh, check us out over on Facebook and Instagram and all those things. You can find out about our shows and more. Send your feedback to feedback at thebrewingnetwork.com. Thanks to More Beer once again for sponsoring this program and every program that we do. And we'll see you next time right here on The Session. The Session is a production of The Brewing Network and brought to you by More Beer. Check them out at morebeer.com. Find more content and live video of this show on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brewing network. For sponsorship opportunities and information, please reach out to advertising at thebrewingnetwork.com. To reach our hosts, contact feedback at thebrewingnetwork.com. 